Okay, so um, this is a letter we've been saying that Paul the Apostle wrote to a group of Christians in Corinth, which is that red dot in the middle of Greece. Now, Paul basically devoted most of his adult life to going from place to place to place in the ancient world, telling people about Christ and how they could come to know Him. And this was something he did because Christ Himself wanted this. You can read, this is one of the last things that Jesus said before He ascended to heaven. He told His disciples, "'Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you.'" And so this was This was Jesus' vision, not some political revolution, but his followers going into the world to tell people how to have a relationship with Christ. Now, I realize that idea, spreading uh, the message of Christ around the globe, I realize that's not a popular concept. And uh, especially these days. And I, I don't have time to defend it. But it's, it is clearly something that Jesus wanted. He wanted to see his message reach as many people as possible. And so that's what Paul did. And as is often the case, in his attempts to tell people about Christ, things went sideways. He was at Corinth for about 18 months. And while he was there, a lot of people responded to the message about Christ. But after he left, there were a lot of problems. There was so much turmoil in the church, Paul thought the Corinthians were going to tear themselves apart. And so he's worried. And you can pick that up. When we start in the middle of 2 Corinthians 2, you can hear just how concerned he is and what he was struggling with. He says, When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened uh, for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit. Not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Okay, so the backdrop of this is that Paul had made a very painful visit after he heard about turmoil in the church at Corinth. And he did what he could to get the church back on track, and he followed that visit up with what he calls a letter that could cause sorrow. And it was a very sharply worded letter urging them to take the steps they needed to take to get their church functioning again. And then after he sent this letter, and this happens to anybody that that wants to serve God, help people get to know God, After he sent that letter, there was a period of anguish where he was like, how are these guys going to respond to this? What direction is this church going to go in? We talked a couple weeks ago about how because of, you know, just the limitations of communication back then, you could go through long stretches of just being completely in the dark. And that's oftentimes what it's like when we're in our attempts to talk to someone to help them understand Christ, we're not sure how they're going to respond. We're not sure what the next step is. Uh, years ago, I was uh, on a, I'm going to skip this slide, a backpacking trip in Montana. This is uh, the Absorca Beartooth Range. This is in southwest Montana. And me and a buddy of mine made kind of a rookie mistake we got to the top of Mount Tempest too late in the day. Okay, our whole goal was to get on top of this mountain. It was about 4 p.m. when we reached the summit. Okay, so we're coming down this, this I don't know what it was, 13,500 foot peak or whatever, and it starts to snow. And then it really started to snow, and it was getting dark. And so we got our map out. We're like, we better get our bearings before it's totally dark. Meanwhile, the path, with, which is rock piles, is increasingly getting covered with snow. So we get our map out, and we realize we're in a spot called Froze to Death Plateau. <laughs> Not a place you want to be. 
Not in a snowstorm, not when it's getting dark. We obviously survived. Uh, but that, that sense, you know, in the course of following God, you can have some mountaintop experiences. You can have some amazing things happen, see lives change. That's part of what it's like to follow in, uh, Christ in this mission to take the message out. But there are also stretches where it feels like you're on froze-to-death plateau without a clear path forward. There are quite a few times like that. And you'll see sprinkles of this throughout this letter. Paul talking about being perplexed. Paul talking about being struck down. Just like, I, I don't know, this whole church at Corinth, it's up in the air. It could go any direction, and I'm in the dark. I don't know what I'm going to come back to if, when, if and when I get back to Corinth again. And so, it's really true. There are ups and downs. Ups and downs in the Christian life. High points and low points. And yet, look at this amazing statement. This is such a crazy statement. Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Look at that. Look at that. That's a, one of the many promises in the Bible. God always leads us, those who have trusted him for their salvation. He always leads us in triumph in Christ. And I just wonder, does that match your experience? I think this is one of these passages that's kind of tough to get our brain around. I remember once I was talking to somebody in my family who I love dearly, and I was just sharing with her what I was learning about Christ. I was a really young Christian, super excited about following God, and she interrupts me. And she said, look, Mike, I had a friend once who used to tell me about Jesus, and I told them, if you want to remain my friend, you need to pick a different topic to talk about. That did not feel like triumph, right? That felt like a big setback. That felt like I was jeopardizing this relationship with somebody that I cared about. There, there are going to be times like that, no doubt. Anyone who purposes to carry out this mission that Christ gave us will feel like you're in a box canyon sometimes, not clear about what to do next. So how do we understand this promise? God always leads us in triumph. That's what I want to get at this morning. First, what kind of triumph is it? Then how does God always lead us, always lead us in triumph? And then what role do we play in this? Okay, starting out with the kind of triumph it is, this honestly, this concept of a triumph in Christ right there, it is so wildly misunderstood, and it has been misunderstood over the course of the church, over history. Let's Let's just read the whole passage again and just see if you can get a better sense of what he's talking about. It says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and who manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Okay, so that's, that's Paul's explanation of what this triumph is. Some have said, maybe this is a political triumph. Maybe finally we can get our social agenda out there in the culture and have things Christ's way, our way. There's been whole Christian states that have been built on the concept that the triumph in Christ is a human state ordered along Christian lines. I don't see anything like that in this passage. Nothing like that. You know, another uh, popular view of this is that there's this triumph over sickness, poverty, and pain that's being promised. Like, you know, if, you, if you're sick, you can be healed. If you're, if you're lacking resources... God can financially bless you. He can take away your suffering, and he can give you joy. He could lead you into his triumph. 
It's like, can I get an amen? You know, that kind of, yeah, that's what he offers. But again, I don't see that here. This isn't some kind of ticket out of some of the difficulties. Jesus actually said that in the world we have tribulation. Okay, so whatever this triumph is, it's, it's not those things. If you, if you look at the way different passages describe this, um, different translations, this word here, triumph, is normally translated triumphal procession. That's how that Greek word was used in, in the first century. And <clears throat> it's basically uh, Christ's triumphal procession, a parade. This is a Roman concept. This is really something that you would see in the Roman Empire. When a conquering general returned from an important battle toward the city, the people of Rome would come out from the city to meet that general and then walk with him back into the city celebrating this victory. Okay, and so you've got this huge parade where there's captives, you know, the... the, the the opposing general and his soldiers in chains, heads down, walking in the front of this parade. Uh, you've got spoils of war, the booty. Uh, you've got like crazy stuff, animals from the region that they conquered. They would have 3D like dioramas of the land that they took and what it looked like. They'd have piles of coin and treasure and armor and, you know, captured weapons and so on. And then you'd also have the victorious general who rode a gilded four-horse four chariot and who was attended by his officers on horseback. And people back then went absolutely bananas over this. This is one of the biggest, the biggest things that people turned out for because this meant... They get to live another day. This meant their civilization could continue. You know, if they had lost to Hannibal, for example, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have history books about the Roman Empire. We'd be talking about the Empire of Carthage. Right? These, this was life or death that a general would come back with this huge victory and this whole, this whole procession, this triumph, this parade to celebrate what happens. And so that's his image. That's, this is a big extended analogy. It's a metaphor for, for what we're doing with Christ in the Christian life. It's like this triumphal procession of a victorious general. He also mentions the sweet aroma. And this is likely these priests, these uh, priests that worship the, the uh, Roman gods would have incense, and they'd swing these censers filled with incense, and the aroma would fill the whole area. And of course, it smelled differently depending on your perspective. If you were a captive, that was the smell of death. Uh, these captives would be led, led up to the temple of Jupiter and strangled to death. That's how the parade ended from them. And then, of course, to the Romans and to the conquering general and to all the assembled senate and all that, it was a smell of life and victory, okay? And so that, just try to picture that whole scene. That's what he's talking about when he talks about a triumph. Now, in the Christian life, obviously, Christ is the conquering general. And the stakes in the victory that he won were even higher because, according to the Bible, humanity is in a dire situation. Humans are dead in their sin, apart from God. Just, it just simply means that none of us could ever live a life that would merit God's acceptance based on our behavior and our performance. Nobody can do that. We're all dead because of our sins before we come into a relationship with Christ. And he says, as far as Christ and the victory he won, Jesus canceled that record, the charges against us, this overwhelming debt that we could never work off on our own. You know, this is the weight of our sin. He canceled the record of all those charges and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In other words, he took all of those things that we've ever done wrong and absorbed the just 
punishment from God onto himself instead on the cross. And then in this way, it says he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. These are, you know, Satan and his demons, these powerful spiritual beings who keep people in darkness. He disarmed them and shamed them publicly by his literally triumph over them on the cross. Okay, and so this, this is how Paul, this is his self-perception. I'm, I'm participating with Christ, my victorious general, who won this amazing victory out of love for me, and I'm going around like that incense that, that priests are burning and that's filtering across the whole crowd. Paul's like, my life and your life as a Christ follower is about making the knowledge of that amazing victory known in the world around us. That sweet aroma, look what he says. What is it? It's the knowledge of him in every place, and it's coming through us. It's actually going out from us and affecting other people. Now, one other thing about this, just like you might imagine, just like the way people reacted to the incense back in the first century, people react to odors in different ways. I, mean, I was thinking about the first time my dad took me to a farm. My dad grew up on this farm in western New York, spent his summers there. And I remember showing up, we pulled up to my aunt's driveway, and I'm like, what is, what is that smell? I'm like, ah! And he, he, we step out of the car and go to the barn, and my dad's like, ah, oh, cow manure. Just such a great smell. I'm just like, I'm barely able, you know, my eyes are watering, I can barely stand it. And he's having all these sweet memories to his, you know, his childhood. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is, sauerkraut, the smell of, uh, like, mint. Ever have somebody, uh, I have a buddy who gets, like, incredibly nauseous if he even sniffs mint. So, yeah, this, this scent, this message coming out from us, filtering out into the world, we're going to get a lot of different reactions to it. One reaction is someone like, they hear about Christ, and it's, it's like an aroma from life to life. A good example of this is a guy named John Newton. Newton uh, used to be the captain of a slave ship. And he, was, he knew he was a foul, filthy, evil man. He did some unspeakably horrible things uh, while he was in that role. And then someone told him about how salvation that he could never earn was available for free through Christ. And to him, he was like, a great sinner needs a great Savior, and thank God he's there. And it completely changed his life. He wrote Amazing Grace. You know, he, for him, it was an aroma from life to life. But then for others, and you've probably run into folks like this, not so much. You know, they hear that they need to be forgiven, just like we all do. They hear that Christ is the way to having a relationship, an eternal relationship with God. And there's something about that that is intrinsically offensive. And it's not, maybe not the delivery, or it's just the message itself, the idea that I would need to bend the knee and, and acknowledge my need for forgiveness, just the whole enterprise. I remember one guy telling me, even if Jesus showed up in front of me and revealed the holes in his hands, I'd want nothing to do with that. Okay? And so for some people, yeah, no thanks. And of course, one other factor in this whole scenario is that we're involved. It's not just the message, but it's the people the message is coming through. Okay? So how we live is part of this. That means... It's possible, even as great as this message is, for us to make it stink. And we can make it stinky by, you know, doing the kind of things that drive us nuts. We see a pastor who's like up here in a setting like this, castigating people for certain kinds of behavior. And then, you know, later in the week behind closed doors, he's doing those very things. It's hypocrisy. We're like, ah, 
I can't believe that guy would do that. Or you see people that are pushy or offensive or judgmental or, or just mean. And again, those are all things that we can do to take a great message and just, just give it this musty, stinky smell that's unnecessarily offensive to everyone. Of course, the flip side is, and this is part of why I'm here, is when we're able to show the love that God has given us and pour that out to other people, when we're able to really care for people that we're talking to about Christ, when they can tell we care, when they can see our love relationships with each other in community, there is just, just as powerfully something good and winsome and sweet about that. Okay, so that's, that's the whole picture. That's the kind of triumph in Christ that he's talking about in this passage. Now, how is it that God always, in every case, can lead us in triumph? I don't know if you know much about the history of the church in Germany, uh, but in the late 30s and early 40s, it had to have been difficult for, for Christians in Germany to see a way forward. You had... Uh, <clears throat> a call to merge Christianity with National Socialism with the Nazi Party. You had a, a call for churches to come under one umbrella, under one pastor who was a member of the Nazi Party. You had people calling for any hint of Jewishness, including the use of the Old Testament, to be purged from the church. And eventually the call came for leaders of every single church in Germany to pledge unconditional allegiance to Hitler. Okay, so for this generation of believers at that time, it really felt like a curtain was descending. Very difficult to see what could, what, you know, what the way forward is. And, you know, that's an extreme case, but there are times, you know, we're in a home church, and maybe there's been some people that have gotten seriously sick. They're just not as involved as they used to be. Maybe a few other people have moved away for whatever reason, and we've had maybe a, some conflict and misunderstanding. And, and you, walk into, you walk into a home group, and you're just like, I, I, I'm worried. I don't know where we're headed. And so this kind of situation where it just seems like I, I don't see any bright spots on the horizon, when trends are really bad, how does Christ always lead us in his triumphal procession? Well, I think one thing to realize is with this procession, there are some sweet promises. You know, when you think about what this is, God's activity in the world, God working through His people to get His message about His Son out to everywhere. There are a lot of promises connected with this. Jesus told His disciples, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's like, I'll see to it that the movement that begins here will, will succeed. Later in the same book, he says, this gospel of the kingdom. In, in other words, the message that Jesus came to bring the world, he says it will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end's going to come. So Jesus saw a future where that little band of people would go out into the world and gradually diffuse this message everywhere. And amazingly, that's, that's what we've seen in our own day. And then at the far end of history, when all of this is uh, coming to a close, the Bible sees this vision of the future in heaven. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one can count, uh, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and language, will be standing before the throne. And so, it's totally true. Local conditions vary. There are highs and lows. But by throwing in with Christ, by following Christ, we are all part of a triumph that nothing can stop. This, this vision is going to be, you know, where we're all headed is, is something like the opening ceremony in the Olympics. 
You ever see, you know, you walk all these nations and all these colors and all this culture assembles in a stadium or whatever. That, that is something that we're headed for. Certainly, people from every corner of the earth having responded to God's people sharing this message. And in the meantime, kind of like an alchemist, God is able to take any challenge any adverse circumstance, and change it into an opportunity. In other words, and this is something that, you know, uh, Romans 8, 28, 28, God works all things for the good for those who love him. This, this is the assertion that no matter what you face, even, even that very thing is something God can use to advance this procession. And Paul himself is a living example of this. You know, Paul, at one point in his ministry, was uh, imprisoned in Rome. And this is one of the most mobile people of his era. He was all over the Mediterranean basin and then all of a sudden stuck in a prison in Rome, unable to do anything but just sit there. And you'd think, well, that would curtail his ability to share the knowledge of Christ, but... Actually, God used it to put it in overdrive. You know, the, from, from the best of what we can tell, Paul wasn't just chained to the wall. He was under the guard of the Praetorians, and they would rotate in shifts and be chained to their political prisoners, which is what Paul was. And what's funny, though, is, you know, Paul, Paul's there chained to them, and he follows that chain over to the guard. He's like, you're my captive audience. And then he begins in six-hour rotating shifts, talking with guy after guy after guy about the Lord. And these Praetorians, part of what their job was, was to go work in the frontier of the empire. They were one of the most mobile group of people in Rome. And it's, it's cert- we know from Philippians, many of them became followers of Christ And they certainly took that message to every corner of the empire. Paul couldn't go anywhere, but his captive audience was taking off all over the place. And then, of course, during this same window of time, uh, you know, what did Paul do with all all those idle hours? He wrote the prison epistles. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Books that have changed the lives of millions of people, right? So you have what seems like an impossible situation, and God uses the features of that very crisis, that difficulty, to even do more to get his message out. And so it's really true. God can, in any case, keep advancing this triumph. The other thing that, uh, just two more things to, to factor in here, and this is a big one, and we easily forget this. This passage makes it crystal clear that the victory is not tied to how people respond. Look at this. Some see it as an aroma from death to death. Others see the message as an aroma from life to life. I don't know. It couldn't be clearer. We can't measure whether we're moving forward in this triumph by looking at how people right in front of us are responding. And here's the other piece of this we got to keep in mind. This parade is not over, not by a long shot. All the results are not in yet. I, uh, about, I don't know, 30 years ago, I ran a 5K race. It was downtown. It was like a Halloween fun run, something like that. So anyhow, I'm running this race. And I, I take off in the starting line, and there's this guy that's kind of limping like this as he runs. And he's, he's got this really deep, like, <gasps> you know, breathing, super heavy, really loud, really heavy. And I'm next to this guy. Every step he takes makes me feel tired. I'm like, I got to get ahead of this guy. So I just take off. And I, I honestly, halfway through the race, I'd forgotten about him. I was, you know, I was in pretty good shape at that time. I was making pretty good, pretty good time. Didn't think I'd ever see this, this guy again. And then at about two and a half miles... I heard this really faint, uh, uh, and it got louder and louder 
and I look back and I see this guy lurching toward me, picking up speed, and that dude blew by me. And well, I don't know how, uh, what time he finished in, but it was way ahead of me. And I remember thinking, I gave that guy no chance. I, I never thought he'd cross the finish line, let alone pass most of the people in this race. And I think we got to remember, there are people we're coming in contact with like that. People that maybe we tried to help, maybe they reacted well but, or they didn't, but we haven't been in touch with them. In, in a lot of cases, we've assumed what I did there, probably not very effective. I'm not sure that contributed anything to this triumph. And we will be proved wrong by uh, whether it's in this life or the next, we're going to be proved wrong when we're stunned to see people we've forgotten about really advancing and going on to follow God with all of their heart. I, uh, I had a, a great opportunity a while back. I was talking to a friend of mine who explained that he had be- he'd, he'd come to Christ because someone gave him one of those chick publications. You remember those? It's like a Christian tract. I was going to put a picture of him up. I'm not recommending passing tracts out. Not a great idea. But my friend received this tract from, from someone else. And he, he was like, huh. He was intrigued. And so he made an extended trip to the bathroom. This is all true. And while sitting there, He read this tract cover to cover, and he looked up and he said, Christ, I recognize my need for forgiveness. I thank you for what you've done. I'm glad that I can just have a relationship with you for free. And he, that, in that moment, kind of Martin Luther style, if you know the story, he became a Christian in that moment because of this tract that he read. Well, fast forward several years later, I had found out who this guy had got the tract from. It was someone else that I knew. And both men just happened to be in the same room. And so I I told the guy that had passed out the tract that hadn't seen this other guy for 10 years, I was like, I got someone to meet. He's got a story I think you might be interested in. And so I got to watch as, uh, as my first friend was able to explain how his life was changed by just that simple offer of here's a booklet that that talks about Christianity. And again, you know, that's what I would call a meager attempt. Not even the the way that I don't even think it's an effective way to do things. I'm just saying, though, there's things that we've thrown away that we've forgotten totally about, where we've made a feeble effort to try to talk to God about, talk to someone about God. And we're going to find out that was enormously important in someone's life someday. The parade is not over. And so there you go. That, I think those are reasons why we can say this triumph always continues. Now, what about our role in it? What, what, what actually can we do to really be a vital part of this? One is to follow God's lead, right? It's God leading us in this triumph. And so just looking to him, what is it that you want from me, God? Well, one thing that's really clear, and this is a starting point, this is how we enter this whole triumphal procession, is by having the humility, like like my friend, to just call out to Christ and recognize, I could never live the life that you lived for me. Thank you for dying for me. I want to begin a relationship with you. That's, that's, That's just the basic beginning, just benefiting. You don't have to do or accomplish or stop, or, you know, change anything. You can just appeal to Christ and the victory that he won to begin a relationship with him. And then, obviously, if we're going to be led, we have to let God's word, his message, his truth actually inform our actions. You think about um, if I wanted to follow somebody's leadership, if I wanted to follow a popular figure. I would want to hear from what they're saying. I'd want to, I'd want to maybe catch out a, a YouTube video. I'd want to figure out how can I understand where this person's coming from. And we have that in the Bible. We have God's, not just this truth or that truth, but his whole perspective 
on life. And to the degree that we're exposed to that, it'll, it'll inform our actions. It'll help us follow his lead. I think with this intake is really crucial. There are a lot of quiet moments in our life like this where maybe we're listening to a podcast or listening to some great music or maybe, uh, I don't know, an audio book or something like that. And there's, you know, you multiply that. When I'm walking the dog, before I go to sleep, you know, when I have a few minutes just to chill out and sit down. And somewhere in that space, in the margins of our life, this is where we either learn to lead, uh, follow God's lead or not. Because it's as we open our heart and just have this appetite to take in what God teaches, we find a way to bring that into our life. And we start to live, not talk radio driving our priorities, not uh, these other things, but letting God's word inform and shape our outlook. That's when we're able to be more effectively led by God. That doesn't mean we never listen to like the news or something like that. It's just there's got to be somewhere in our lives where we're taking in what God has to say in the, in the Bible. The other thing that's a key piece here is it's Christ's triumph, not ours. And so there's an implication here that it's something that we have to depend on him to do. I mean, just think about how staggering this task is, this triumph, what it really involves. Manifesting the knowledge of Christ in every place, that's a huge enterprise. You know, just recently, just last week, we did a camp, Camp Geronimo over at Building X. And we invited uh, kids from all over the uh, north end of town to come hear the Bible taught, to get some food, play some sports. And it was incredible. I think there was 115 kids or something like that that came out, and their families came out. And there was a ton of receptivity to hearing about Christ. And you realize, man, that's just this teeny part of the city. And this is just one city and just one country on one planet. Just, it's staggering to think about the scope of this. That's why Paul, I don't know if you caught this, he asks in verse 16, who's adequate for these things? And what's the assumed answer? Nobody, right? What, what God wants us to be part of, this procession is so beyond our ability. It's obviously beyond our ability. So much so, if that's true, then we must be spending way too much time worried about our own adequacy. We're not going to find the resources by looking inside to carry out a task like this. Think about um, the theme in the Bible of God repeatedly putting people that follow him in impossible situations that they can't handle on their own. Happens so often. This is, uh, God, it's really dark, but this is, Nebuchadnezzar on the left telling Daniel, I want you to tell me the dream I had last night and what it meant. That's impossible, right? And Daniel knew it was impossible. So he called a prayer meeting and he pled with his, his buddies. And they're like, we have to plead with God to reveal this mystery to us. That is the only way forward. God will do this or there's nothing we can do. Same thing with uh, Andrew and, and Jesus. Andrew was actually a little more salty. Jesus was trying to get the disciples to feed 5,000 people. He's like, look, I've got, you know, five loaves and two fish here, and it's not even mine. It's this, this kid's over here. But he at least was able to say, this is what we have, Jesus. What can you do with it? Okay, and so that, that theme, I'm overwhelmed I'm under-resourced. I have opposition and circumstances that are incredibly challenging. What's the way forward? It's by depending on God. That's it. And so you see later uh, in the same discussion, Paul says, such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. That's right. That is the only source of the power and strength that we need to be able to do this. I remember as a really young uh, Christian, 
thinking this through and, and really kind of getting locked into two options initially. And this is something that I think is consistent with what the Bible calls our sin nature. It's that part of us that's allergic to God, that doesn't want to do anything but, but to do something for self. Our sin nature basically gives us two options. I've got this. I can do it. Yes, of course I'll handle that, God. I've got this. I'm, I've got it under control. The other option would be, there's no way I could ever do that, so I won't. That's just, don't even ask me. I, I could never do this. This is a middle way. This passage is, uh, this concept of dependence means a willingness to serve beyond your perceived area of competence and to trust God to come through. This is a lot of, a lot of us, this is where we draw the line. We see something that we, we obviously aren't able to do. And uh, to step forward in faith and take a scary step and, and basically throw ourselves on God and Him coming through, it's, it's difficult to do. But this is, this is part of this procession, is, is identifying, you know, okay, this is something I know you've wanted me to do. I feel completely inadequate to do it. And yet, I believe you're in the mix. You're leading this. I can depend on you to give me the strength I need. One last thing he brings up is not peddling the Word of God. He says, we're not like many, peddling the Word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. All right, when I hear peddling, that's kind of a funny word, uh, I think about companies that make just incredible claims about their products that are t totally over the top, just to make money and to sell, to sell some uh, whatever they're selling. I remember uh, I, I go running here at work. I periodically will go for a run, and we have a shower at the office. And so I finished my run, I got, you know, my gym bag and stuff, and I go in to take a shower, and I realize I forgot my, my body wash. And so, you know, true confession, I go into the shower, and I notice somebody else left a bottle there. And I took a little bit. And so this particular bottle of body wash, I think it, it said it was exfoliating semarine body wash. I'd never been exfoliated before, you know. <laughs> I'm reading this, and I'm like, it's saying that it's going to restore balance, that it's going to bring back skin tone, that there's going to be an energizing refresh. I'm like, if I use this body wash, it's going to change my life, right? <laughs> Which is preposterous because it's soap, right? But people will do that kind of thing with the Bible where they're basically distorting it and they make these fantastic claims to get you to buy into what they're saying so that they can get rich. You know, you want that dream home? Well, if you claim that in faith and you send us a love offering so that we pray for you, you'll have what you want. Those, those kind of things. Taking the Bible and using it as a way to pray on people. Talk about making the aroma stinky, right? That is not part of this procession. What he throws out as an alternative is very, very simple. It's just sincerely putting forth God's message, not our opinion. And by sincerely, it's that sense that I actually care about the person that I'm talking to, regardless of how they respond. I'm actually motivated by a sincere desire to enrich them. And there's this confidence that what I'm giving them, God's message, can handle itself. It has its own intrinsic power. I don't have to do a bunch of gymnastics to make this, this word, this message, have its effect. You know, some of the most fruitful ministries in the history of the uh, last century in this country were led by people who had a high level of confidence just in the power of the word. Think about Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel. I went out to visit him. He'd get up in a, a stage like this, no PowerPoint. He would just grab the podium and in a monotone voice with a King James Bible, he just taught the Bible. 
And he would start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation and then do it again every five years. That's all they did. And it, it's turned out that that ministry has spawned more church plants in North America and around the world. I think it's like 1,500 than probably any other movement in our day. And it's just because they were straight up teaching and confident that straight up teaching God's word would be enough. So man, let's love people and let's be confident that this, this message that we're sharing has potency. Okay, so there you go, just to summarize the whole thing, in case I lost you five minutes in, right? <laughs> Serving God is confusing, yes. Christ still invites you to enter his triumph. He can always lead you in triumph. Doesn't matter what situation you're in. And you can enter into this by following his lead, depending on him and sharing this message with sincerity. So there you go.